Have you enjoyed yourself so, thus far? Yes. yes. We are ready to get into the word, into the message that the Father has given to speak into our lives so that we can be battle ready. Amen. 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 If you will take out your Bibles and let us turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And while you're turning there, I do want to say my gratitude and thank you to all of you pastors for coming out here and being a part of this men's conference. Amen. Amen. Pastor James, my brother. Oh, anointed man of God. That word last night was on point. Devil ain't got no heat. The one who's got the heat is God. And we are called to be firemen or men on fire. Amen. I woke up this morning. I was sharing earlier with a pastor that when I woke up this morning, I was thinking about that word. And Holy Spirit said to me, that's why Elijah, <laughs> when he challenged the prophets of Baal, how many of you know that God sometimes fixes fights? <laughs> and Elijah challenged Baal to do something that he couldn't do. Because he knew that the devil could not show up in something that he's not. But then for God to show up, God didn't even have to put on a display. All he had to do was show up because he is fire. And on top of that, he helped himself to a drink of water. Are you all with me? Are you all know the story? Yes. How thoughtful. Of Elijah to give the father a drink of water. He poured so much water on there. Filled the whole trench. Wow. When I was praying for this year's men's conference. Pastor James the Lord gave you me. Gave you to me. And after hearing uh, your wife's testimony. I knew that God had given me a man who has been through the fire. And so I say thank you sir. For allowing the Lord to use you mightily in this conference. Can we give the Lord praise for Pastor James? Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, my brother. Pastor Baker, thank you so much for being here with us today and in this conference, sir. So grateful for your friendship. Yes. Thank you, sir, for being here. To all of you men of God. I believe that you are here for a reason. God doesn't work in coincidence. There's only God incidences. You are here for a reason. And I believe that you have a purpose in for which God has called you to fulfill. And in order to fulfill that, we have to be battle ready. Can you say amen? amen. Whether you realize it or not, we are in a battle. And what will determine whether or not you remain standing, it is determined whether you are battle ready or not. We used to have this scene when we were kids, ready or not, here I come. That's what the devil say. But if you battle ready, he better be ready for us. Are y'all with me here? How many of you believe in God? How many of you know how big your God is? How many of you know that there's no one greater than God? Yes, yes, we know that God is great. So if you know that God is great, don't run from the devil. Stand that joker in his face and... <clears throat> And tell him greater is he that is. Mm. You're here for a reason. Amen. Faith in action women. Can we give our women a hand? Thank you for helping out to make sure that all of our men could be a part of this conference. I do want to say thank you. And I am going to name some names. But if I, if, if I don't mention your name, please do not take offense to it. I am so grateful for everyone. But I want to thank the Galzote family for putting this together. My God. When you put, a, you put out a vision and you're able to walk in here and it's put together. It's a, that's only God. Sister Shani and the decor and Brother Joey with the centerpieces. Sister Bridget with the food. 
And let me just say to all of you men and women who have taken out the time to help set up and to serve and to decorate and to be a part of this and serving in different ways, I cannot tell you, words cannot express my gratitude. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Brother Ray, thank you for being here today, brother. I told you, we defeat the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Never forget what God has done in your life. And let me tell you, there are people that are going to come to know the Lord through you and your wife. Your son, like God's son, was sacrificed so that more would come to know him. There's coming a harvest. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat dies, only then can it produce more. Kapono, his righteousness. Pono means righteousness. Kapono was sown for harvest that the Lord is going to bring through your lives. And all glory to God because he is worthy. Even though he uses us when we are not worthy, he uses, he works through us because we know that whatever he does through us, he gets the glory. So somebody give God some glory in this house. My God. Last but not least, to my wife and my queen, Pastor Cassie. Your love and your support. Mm. You are an amazing woman of God. And I'm blessed to be your husband. I love you. I love you. I love you. All right, let's get out of this mushy stuff so I can see. <laughs> My God. Let us get into the word. Are you all ready? You should be at 1 Samuel 30. Yes. As I shared last night, a few months ago, the Lord gave me a vision while I was driving and I saw a Roman soldier who was fully armed. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, my people are not ready for battle. And I began to see the spiritual warfare that we as believers face that many of us do not realize. And I began to see this hot piece of metal as it was being forged and shaped into a sword, as it was pounded on the anvil and, and how, how it was being grinded into a weapon that would be battle ready and at that moment i knew that the theme of this men's conference this year for 2019 i actually had another idea how many of you know that god has a way of changing our our ideas yes uh, this year's um, was intended to be fight, and we were going to go with this uh mma and uh and a boxing ring kind of things but how many of you know that when god gets involved in it he knows what he's doing yes my God, battle ready, forged by fire. Let's get into the word. First Samuel 30, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to be reading from the NLT, the New Living Translation. When David and his men arrived home at their town from Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag, and they had crushed Ziklag, not just ransacked it they, they crushed it and burned it to the ground can you imagine taking that turn and seeing everything that you had been working for gone in fire talk about being forged by fire they carried off the women and the children and everyone else but without killing anyone and when David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Can I tell you that you have not cried until you have cried yourself weak? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been there before? You let something happen in your life, it'll take you right there. Yes? David's two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. And David was now in great danger because all of his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk about stoning him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. 
And then he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring me the ephod. And so Abiathar brought it. And then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. For you will surely recover everything. Somebody say everything. everything. That was taken from you. And I want to go down to verse 18. And it reads, David got back everything can i can i just shoot this at you because we often miss this when we're reading the bible david didn't have a bible to read he did not know what was going to happen are y'all with me here yes he didn't know see sometimes we read like we read the story of job and we read right over what he went through because we know at the end right are y'all with me here right the, he didn't have a bible to know what was coming David did not know what was going to happen, even though the Lord had told him that he was going to go after. He didn't know. But here we find David got back everything the Amalekites had taken, and he rescued his two wives, for nothing was missing, small or great, son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. David brought everything. Say everything. Everything, everything back. Title of this message is... Hold on to God. Look at your neighbor and say, hold on to God. Oh, when you don't know what else to do, and even if everybody else turns their back on, to, on you, I want to I wanna tell you to hold on to God, and he will hold on to you. Can you say amen? amen. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Father, for what you have already done in this house. What you've already done in this, in, 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 this, in this setting, in this conference, oh God. Father, I pray that you will continue to speak to your men, oh God. Lord, that you would speak through me. Lord, let it not be my words that are heard, but yours, oh God. Father, we don't have to hear a word from Pastor Jemery, Father. We need to hear from you. So, Lord, I pray for the anointing, not only, Father, upon me, the cause for preaching to be done so well, but, Father, God, also the anointing on our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. Breathe, Spirit of God. Bring revelation to your word so that we can apply it to our lives. Lord, let it not just be information that goes over our heads, but let it be something that we take a hold of, Father. So that we can leave here battle ready, God. Ready to face our Mondays and every days, Father God. Ready to face the world and know that we, because we have a victorious God, we are victorious as well. And Lord, we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. And all God's men and people say, God's men and women say it. Go ahead. Amen and amen. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. There's a TV series, actually, that is called Forge in Fire. And uh, it's amazing to see these bladesmiths where they take this piece of steel and they make it into a weapon. They heat, this, uh, they heat the metal up in a, in a, in a box called a forge. And they have to get it to the right temperature because if they begin to pound it on the anvil while it's still cold, what will happen to the metal is it will begin to form fractures. So that when it is tested, it ends up failing the test. You see, when a blade has been completed, it goes through one more treatment after it has been shaped and after it's been forged and after it's been made. It goes through one more treatment called the quench. And in the quench, what they do is they heat it once again up to a certain temperature, and then they dunk it, baptizo, they baptize it in oil. And that process causes it to become unbreakable, causes it to be, mm, to be battle ready. How many of you know that God has a different kind of forge for us? Yes? And after he has shaped us and after he has formed us, after he has allowed us to go through some things, he allows us to get heat up or to be heated up so that when he anoints us with the oil of his spirit, we will be battle ready. Can you say amen? amen. I want to show you what our forge is in 1 Peter 
chapter 4, verse 12 to 13, it says, And dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. Anybody ever been through some fiery trials in your life? Fiery trials that you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. But how many times do we do that? Something come up and it's like, God, where did this come from? Why am I going through this? Peter says, don't think of it as some, don't be so surprised. You're go, because of what you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you, instead be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ and stuff. I always um, am amazed at these men of old that we read about, even in the book of James. Got to be your favorite, favorite chapter, right? Even in the book of James, he says, dear brothers and sisters, count it all joy. When you face trials and tribulations of all kinds. But. When I'm reading this, I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with this guy. Because when I'm going through stuff, are y'all with me? I mean, I hope I'm talking to some men who know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, you know, maybe I'm talking to somebody else in some other place. But all y'all, when you go through it, you just like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You don't never, y'all with me here. Uh-huh. And he says, count it all joy. I don't know. I don't feel too joyful when I'm going through fiery trials. But he says to count it all joy. He, Peter here says, be glad. Because this forge, this trials, make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Isaiah 48 and 10 says this. It says, behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. For I have tried you in the furnace, in the furnace, the forge of affliction. Wow. Did you know that it is the things that we suffer and that we struggle through that God uses to refine and to shape us into what he has planned for our lives? <clears throat> now, if you've been around the church for a while, we have a certain saying. Um, it is God is good. Now, I have a little revelation for you. Y'all ready for this? You, you, are y'all ready for this? All the time. Watch this. All the time actually means all the time. It's not just when the sun is shining. It's not when just the kids are behaving. It's not when the wife has nothing but good to say about you. It's not when your boss gives you a raise, but God is good. Oh, so when the lights get shut off, God is good. When the principal calls you in for a meeting for your son, God is good. When the wife wants to have a little talk, God is mm, Just check it. And when you <laughs> How many of you love them little talks? Yeah, stop lying. Stop lying. When the boss lays you off, God is good. Why is he good? Because Romans 8 and 28 says this. I want you to notice how he writes it. He says, and we know. Do you know? See, it's so important that you know this. Do you know this? He says, and we know. So part of being battle ready is to know that what I'm, that what I'm going through right now, what does he say? Works together. He says, for I, we know that all things work together for the, what is it? Good of them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. You have a purpose in God. Yes, you have a purpose in God. Then everything that you're going through in your life, whether it is good or bad, in the way you see it, is good for you. Therefore, God is. Thank you. That's why Pastor James Abednego could say, even if he doesn't, God is still good. Even if he doesn't, God is. You see, anybody can praise God when I got a new car or a new house or all the things that I want. Anybody can praise God. But when you can praise God when you ain't got it. That's what that's what it means to be a true worshiper. Because God uses the hard times that we go through as a forge to make us into a weapon that he is designed to defeat the enemy. And no one knew this better than King David. 
In fact, David said in Psalms 18 and 31, I'm taking this from the TEV version. He says, and the Lord alone is God. He alone is our defense. See, part, part of your ability to be battle ready is to know who your God is. Amen. Are y'all with me here? Okay. Part of being battle ready is to know who your God is because if God be for me, then <laughs> the reason why David was able to stand in the face of Goliath wasn't because he came at Goliath in his own strength. He said, you come at me with a spear, a javelin, a, a sword, but I come at you in the name of, see, part of being, are y'all with me? You have to know who your God is. And see, that's why David says, my God he, my Lord is alone God, and God alone is my defense. He is the God who makes me strong, who makes my path straight. He makes me sure-footed as a deer, and he keeps me safe on the mountains, for he trains me for battle so that I can use the strongest bow. As men, we are created to be fighters. I'm going to say that again. As men, we are created to be fighters, but I'm not just talking physically. Something happens when you're about 11 to 13 years old, where your body is now introduced to a new hormone called testosterone. And the things start to change where along with your voice begins to change. You know what is funny is we were watching some old videos and some of my nephews, when they were really young and they were saying things on there, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't even remember when I used to sound like that. That's what I sounded like. Because now they got this low voice. And, and so, so other than the fact that, you know, your voice changes and you have a new growth of hair. And then those girls that used to have cooties start looking like cuties. So, something else is developed too. You develop something called aggression. And see, aggression is a natural thing that God has given to us as a gift because we are designed to be providers and also protectors of our family and both do not come easily. Now, aggression is never to be used to attack our wives or our children because you should never hurt those that you are called to protect. Can you say amen? In fact, anytime a husband or a father becomes abusive, that is called abnormal. And that's why abuse, ab, use, ab, abnormal, use. That's what abuse is. It's abnormal. Because we are designed to be the protectors and providers. And because of this, we are designed to be fighters. We are designed to be men that will not just lay down and let the enemy take what belongs to us. There has to be something deep down inside of you that is willing to put the welfare of those in whom you are responsible for above your own. But today, I see a lot of selfish little boys in grown men's bodies. You see, any two-year-old child can cry and fuss to get their way. And you don't, you come too late to tell me that grown men don't throw a fit. Or let me call it this, that grown men don't have tantrums. Anytime you are fussing to get your own way, you're behaving like a child. That's where we used to say it's tight, but it's right. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, Paul says this. He says, when I was a child, I spoke, I thought, and I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Look at your neighbor and tell him, put it away, boy. It's time to grow up. And I'm sorry if you thought that this was going to be a pampering conference. But our women's conference is in July and you're about three months late. <laughs> Our women don't play either. <laughs> so you wouldn't get no pampers there either. <laughs> See, I was taught that a real man was one who puts the needs of others before his own. That's what I was taught. And I do have to say this, and some of you can, can probably agree with me. Uh, today is so different from when I was growing up. In my day, we had something called winners. And we have something called losers. Y'all remember what that was? Because today they say, oh, it's too harsh for you to tell someone that they lost. Are you kidding me? 
It was losing that gave us the incentive to work hard so that, oh, God, come on. So, in fact, this is what, this is what, it is the struggle that makes the victory that much sweeter. But if every, if everybody's a winner, there's no victory. It was the losing. It was the losing that caused us to work harder. So that when we actually became a winner, it was worth fighting for. But because of this mindset today, this mind, there, there's a mindset that is even coming to the church. And pastors, you, you probably can agree with me. Where people want to be on a mountaintop without first traversing the valley. Would you turn to the next slide? How many of you know that it is the valleys that shape the mountains? There can be no highs without there being lows. And it is the valley that God uses to prepare us for the mountain. You know, here, here's something that the Lord showed me. When you're in the valley and you fall, it's not that hard to get back up because you're on the, on the ground and you're on the bottom. But when you fall from the mountain... You fall because you forgot who got you there. And because of that, it is that much harder to get back up. You know, I've worked in construction for over 20 years. We have this saying, it's not the fall that kills you. <laughs> it's the sudden stop. Some people are falling and you don't even realize until you... And this is what God wanted me to tell you today. Don't forget the God of your valley. You know, I was privileged to accompany Pastor James and Pastor Bula and the other pastors that minister and Pastor Baker as well on uh, the Free Inside Ministries, the radio, um, the radio uh, program. And I heard Pastor Villa and his wife sing a song that reminded me of when I was studying this. And there was a verse in there that said, I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for all the storms he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I never know that God could solve them. I never know what faith in God would do. And then it goes like this. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. But through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. My lighter fluid. Yes, amen. Somebody give God some praise. Because it is through the storms and it is through the valleys that teach us to trust in God. So that when we reach the top, we never forget who got us there in the first place. Now, if you know that you are where you are today only because of God, would you give that one who brought you to the top some praise? My God. My God. All right, you can be seated before you fall before this next statement I make. That's why I have a problem, pastors. I have a problem with people who expect a position and are not willing to work for it. Did not Jesus say that the greatest among you must be a servant first? But today we have people that are too proud to clean toilets, but they want me to give them a pulpit. Are y'all with me here? Uh -huh. See, they want to be called a man of God, but they have not been before the face of God. 
Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, who is right, who is able to rightly divide the word of truth. We have too many people that want a title for which they are not trained for. And they expect to carry an anointing but have not gone through the process that produces that anointing. It is the pressing and the crushing of the olive that produces the oil. And my Bible says that it is the steps, not the escalators, not the elevators. It is the steps of a righteous man. See, a righteous man is one who is in right standings with God. But today we have too many preachers preaching what they do not live. And we got too many prophets that are only in it for the prophet. <laughs> this cash app thing is going too crazy. <laughs> Send me some money and I'll give you a word. If you are called to preach, then preach. And if you are called to prophesy, then prophesy whether the time is favorable. People that prophesy for profit are no different from fortune tellers. If I got to send you a fortune for you to tell, you are. And understand, and I understand what the scriptures say in 1 Timothy. I had to bring this up here because I knew where the Lord was leading me into. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well. Especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scriptures say that you must not muzzle the ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place it says those who work deserve their pay. People should bless the man or woman of God because they shared a word that blessed you. Not because if you want a word then send me some money. <clears throat> when are we as God's people going to get back on our face before the holy God to hear God for ourselves so that when the prophet prophesies they're only oh God they're only confirming what God has already been speaking but the truth is is we just don't have time or can I put it another way we don't make time because you make time for what you value. You say, and if you don't have time for God, what are you saying to God? God, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Really? You had all this time for all that Facebook stuff. You had all this time for all that other stuff you were doing, but you ain't got time for me. Oh, okay. See, because we can go through a drive through and pick up some lunch, we expect God to take our order when we pray and then deliver it by the time we pull up to the window. And if God gets our order wrong, then we get angry. Pastor, you hit it. <laughs> and then we don't want to go to church. We don't want to believe in him no more. Um, last time I checked, God is not a clown that he works for Mickey D's. He's not a colonel that he works for KFC. And he does not work for Burger King. He is the king of all kings. And it is we all come on we serve him not the other way around so stop getting it twisted there ain't no curly fries here our king is king of kings and the lord of lords and we serve him whether it's good whether it's bad no matter what he's worthy of all the praise hallelujah Our steps are ordered by God. They're not suggested. They're not offered. It's not at your convenience. They are ordered by God. Because it is through the process that God orders that produces his purpose in us. Can you say amen? amen. Is this speaking to you today? David was not only a fighter, but David was a warrior. Go ahead and show that next line. Can I say David was good at it? 
He didn't, he didn't, but, but he didn't just start off by fighting giants. I mean, he, he learned how to trust God to be able to fight off the bears and to fight off the lions. That's why when it came to Goliath, he told King Saul that the same God who protected me from the claw of the bear and the claw of the, the, claw of the lion, he will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. Notice he didn't even call him a giant. Yes, sir. Say, he's just another Philistine out there, another enemy out there. See, when you know how big your God is, <laughs> it'll dwarf every giant that stands in your way. He might be big to you, but if you know how big your God is. <laughs> you see, I was the older brother. I'm the, the oldest of five. I was the older brother. And see, I always wondered why my younger brothers got me in trouble. Oh, they pick fight. They pick fights with some of the biggest guys in, in, in school. And you know why? Because they thought their bigger brother could take them. And so I got the, my friends coming at me. Bro, you better get your brother right. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? And, and they go and pick a fight, and it's like they expect me to fight for them. But can I tell you that we have a big, 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 bigger brother who no matter what the enemy looks like, hello? No matter what the enemy, now don't get cocky, Okay. Because you get yourself in trouble when you know how big your God is. When the enemy comes at you, you'll be able to stare that joker back in the face and tell him, I ain't going nowhere. Can you say amen? amen? Yeah, amen. The bears and the lions prepared him for the giant. And the giant prepared him for the 200 Philistines that he slayed. David was so good that they began singing songs about him. They said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. David was so good at winning. But there was one thing that David struggled with. You see, when you're good at winning and when you're used to winning, losing makes you sick. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And can I tell you that it wasn't nothing that David did wrong. He didn't do something wrong to earn it. I mean, he was just doing what warriors do. They go to battle. And so while he was out at work, everything that he was working for was gone. And can I tell you what happens when people face loss or when, when they face defeat, they, they, tend to, they, 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 they tend to panic whenever they face defeat. And now David's men that used to be with him began to turn against him. And they spoke of stoning him to death. Because when people start losing, they look for somebody to blame. Can I tell you something funny though? I have never seen blame fix anything. I've never once heard Jesus say, by your blame, you are healed. But they started blaming David because they had become discouraged. And discouragement happens when you lose your courage. Or literally you go through something that sucks it out of you. Can I tell you something? In life, we will face seasons. And I'm learning that when you're young, you feel invincible like Superman. But as time goes by, Superman starts to look like Clark Kent. Are y'all with me? He starts to become more like Clark Kent. Amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. See, when you're young, you're reckless and you're rambunctious. But as you get older, you become a little bit more careful. Especially when you realize that you're not as young as you used to be. Youth is a, is a gift. And some of you young men might not know what I'm talking about. But let me tell you, one phone call. One layoff slip, one spot on your lungs, one moment in your life can completely change your life forever. And it can literally suck every ounce of courage that you have inside of you. But can I tell you what's the scarier thing? The scarier thing is that even though you might be discouraged, most men wear a mask. They wear a facade. And they continue on as life as usual under the mask of discouragement, which tells me that there are men in here today that are discouraged and you're scared because you don't know what to do. But you have too many people that are counting on you and looking at you to be strong. And so you have to look like you have it all together. But truth is that you're only taking it one day at a time. But secretly, you're wondering if it's ever going to get better. 
See, we can train dogs to sit and even elephants to stand on one leg. But just because the elephant is standing on one leg doesn't mean he's happy. And just because you continue waking up every morning, driving through traffic, and you go to work, and you do your time, you come home, and you kiss your wife, and you kiss your children, it doesn't mean you're happy. And can I tell you that no amount of money or success can fill a void of discouragement. That's why this word is so powerful. Because we can learn a thing or two from a man after God's own heart named David you see we are talking about anointed David we're talking about giant killing David we're talking about conquering David and 200 Philistines slaying David this man was used to winning but this same David got hit with something that he had never faced before and now he was discouraged because this one hit home See, it's one thing to face it on your job or somewhere outside, right? And you can go home and you can recharge up so that you can face it again. But what do you do when you get hit in an area that you used to draw strength from? And can I tell you that as a pastor, we often don't only carry our own struggles and our own problems. We often carry the weight of our congregation as well. Am I right, pastors? Yes? See, it wouldn't have been as bad as if, if, if it was only David's house. If it was only David's house, then at least he would have his men to support him and to back him up. But this one hit all of their homes. And so this mighty man of God found himself standing all alone. But can I tell you, men of God, that this is why God does not start us off in the palace. This is why God does not start us off on the mountain. He doesn't take a helicopter and drop us off on a mountain top. Because there's going to be times in your life where you find yourself all alone again. But if you can remember what alone looks like. Remember, this wasn't David's first rodeo. No, he knew what it felt like to be alone and to only have God out on a pasture watching sheep, surrounded by sheep. You know, when you're, when you're a shepherd and all you have is sheep, all you ever hear is, that's bad, pastor, bad, pastor, bad. How's your day? Bad. See, when the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's house, David wasn't even called for the lineup. Because Psalms 51 reveals something about David's situation. It says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So when the prophet told Jesse one of your sons was going to be king, Jesse only called the sons that he was proud of. Because David was probably produced from something that Jesse had on the side. And so David was forged in the fire of rejection. And he had to learn how to get by with just him and God. And this is why some of you don't understand why you had to go through what you went through uh, when you were growing up. Whether, the, whether it was the divorce or whether it was the abuse or whether it was a separation or whether it was abandonment. And even though God did not author it he used it to shape you into what he wants you to be and see when God puts us into the forge he doesn't do it in public he always does it in private David says in Psalms 139 and verse 15 he says my frame was hidden from me when I was being made in secret intricately wroth in the darkness of the womb. He said I was in secret when God began to form me. And I was intricately wrought together. This word wrath actually means it's a term that is used by blacksmiths. In which they use to form or to shape or to forge not for decoration but for battle. And notice that it was done in secret. It was done in seclusion away from everyone else. Because it's not what we do in public that matters. It's what we do in private that prepares you for battle. 
Most people know how to look the part, especially when they're around other Christians. But your true character is not proven in public. Your true character is who you are behind closed doors. Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 17, For all that is secret will eventually be brought out into the open. And everything that is concealed will be brought out into the light to be made known to all. But if we can learn to get into the secret place of the most high God, he can forge us into the man that we are meant to be. Can you say amen? In Psalms 91, this again is a psalm from David. Psalms 91 and 1, it says this. He says, he who dwells, not visits. I want to make that clear. Sometimes people only visit God on Sunday when they go to church. Y'all with me here. He says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of the almighty. And then I want to go down to verse 9. Go to the next slide. If you make the Lord your refuge... If you make the most high your shelter, you know, a lot of people are making their refuge and shelter a lot of other things. They'll run to a bottle. You're supposed to leave the bottle behind, but they run to another bottle. Y'all with me here? Sometimes it comes in a can. They'll run to a pill. They'll run to something that they can smoke. Are are y'all with me here? (laughs) But God says, if you make me your refuge, stop running to other stuff that's only going to ruin you. He says, if you make me your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, then no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. For they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And watch this. And you will trample upon lions and cobras. And you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Do you notice that it was in the secret place that produced the lion and the serpent crushers? Yes? That is, so what is, what is the secret place? Well, Jesus says this in Matthew 6 and 6. He says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your father who is in, where is he? Wow. So God is in secret. No wonder the enemy wants to pervert your secret. Y'all with me here? Because he wants to take you out of where God is. Pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus makes reference to prayer. As a secret place. Okay. Can I hit you with something that might shock you? Y'all with me? Somebody lock the door so they don't run out of here. I no longer believe that there is power in prayer. Did I hit you all right? Don't let them out. No, don't let them out. They're going to think I'm crazy. Let me clarify what I'm saying. I no longer believe that there is power in what we call prayer. You see, Muslims pray, and they pray more than most Christians do. Buddhists pray. Hindus pray. Religious people pray all the time, but there is no power in their prayers. And so if there's no power, then then, then that type of prayer cannot be the secret place that the Bible is speaking about. But I believe that the secret place of prayer is what is found in uh, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. It says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and restore their land. I want you to notice how humility leads to prayer and how prayer leads to seeking his face and how seeking his face causes you to turn from your wicked ways. Are you all with me here? And so I want you to see this. To me, I believe that the secret place is in this face, is in seeking the face of God part. That's where I believe the secret place is. Because I want to show you something really quick. In Hebrew, face. There's a, notice that it didn't say, they that seek my hand. Because when you see... <laughs> Let me give you an analogy. When you go to... Um, let's say you go to Denny's. My son works at Denny's. How many times do you take the time to look at your waiter or waitress's face? Most times, people only look at their hand because I want to know what you're going to bring me. (laughs) Doesn't the Bible say that they that wait upon... uh, 
But we're expecting God to wait on. Uh, it doesn't say wait. It says face. Because when you seek my face, you want to know me. In Hebrew, face actually means, it, 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 it's, it's the word panim. Say panim. It actually means presence. Can I tell you that the presence of God is what makes all the difference? Because when God steps in, every demon has to flee. When God steps in, every sickness is healed. When God steps in, everything changes. And see, David knew this secret place because he had found it on a hillside while watching sheep. And when it was only he and his God. And see, yes, David was known for being a mighty warrior. But David started off as a worshiper. And in one of his psalms, David wrote that his God inhabits. He is enthroned in. He dwells in the praises of his people. And that's why when David was in the midst of the forge of Ziklag, that he found himself all alone. That the next thing we read in 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6, it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now watch this as the praise and worship team starts making their way up here. The Hebrew word for encourage is the word kazah. I want you to say kazah. It literally means, watch this, to take hold of. So when the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord, it means that David took hold of And so when David found himself all alone, David took hold of his God the best way that he knew how. And he began to worship him. And can I tell you that if you just ask Paul and Silas, what happens when you begin to praise God even in the darkest time of your life? For the moment that Paul and Silas began praising God in that Philippian jail, God stepped in. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Can I tell you that you... You were created to be a worshiper. And if you will begin to worship your God and raise a hallelujah, that every chain that the devil held on you will begin to break and the doors will be flung open. Because when the presence of the Lord steps in, everything that is bound is now free. Would you just take 30 seconds and give God some praise in this house? Come on, give God some praise in his house. How many of you know that praise is your weapon? Praise is your weapon. Praise is your weapon against the enemy. I want to show you something. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 11 says, Because of my blood covenant with you, I am so amazed at how God works things. Pastor James, what did you say that God blessed Job with? double because of my blood covenant with you i'm going to release your prisoners from their hopeless cells come home hope filled prisoners for this very day i am declaring a double bonus everything you lost return twice over for the next verse then says for judah my praise is now my weapon so wake up your sons O zion and now my people have become my sword and so when david began to encourage himself in the lord and worship his god he took hold of his God and guess what God did God took hold of him and he became a sword in the hands of his God and the next thing we read in Samuel it says and David got back everything the enemy had taken nothing missing nothing lacking small or great He got his wives back. He got his children back. He got everything that the devil had taken taken from him. David brought everything back. I 
see, this is what the Lord told me. He said, son, hear me, men of God. Hear me, men of God. The Lord told me, son, if you can get the men free, the women and the children will be free too. My God. Men of God, I'm calling you into battle. It's time to be the men that God has called you to be. It's time to start leading your family, not by what you're telling them to do, but by how you live it. To be the head doesn't mean you tell what people do, what, what everybody's supposed to do. It means you go ahead of your family and say, follow me. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow my head. Are y'all with me? Follow Christ. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow my head. God has called us to be the head, not because we're supposed to be in charge, but because we're supposed to go ahead of our family and say, I'm declaring upon every one of you men a Joshua covenant, a, a Joshua promise, a Joshua courage in you that's who stand and say that as for me, and my house. Notice he started with the head. That means it shouldn't be my wife that has to encourage me to pray. It shouldn't be my wife that is telling me uh, it's time to go to church. Oh, come on. It shouldn't. He said as for me. Yes. And my house. You might not want to do it right now, but I'm telling you that as you're a part of my house, you are going to serve the Lord. Yes. You are going to serve the Lord. Yes. And as Zachariah declared, as he declared, he said, wake up your sons. Sons of God, it's time to wake up and become the sword that God uses to push back the enemy. I declare upon you in the name of Jesus that everything that the devil has stolen upon you is coming back double fold. Anything you've lost, anything he's taken is coming back double fold. And can I, next time the devil brings a storm in your life, I want you to say to the devil, say, devil, if you knew what I was going to be after this storm, then you would have never messed with me. Because I'm taking it back and I'm taking it with interest. It's coming back double fold. I declare a double fold anointing on your life that everything that was taken is coming back. Somebody give God some praise yes. like you know you got the victory. Yes, Father God. I got one more thing to share with you. Can you handle one more? Yes. And then we're going to pray. Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle. Paul used the term wrestle. But when he's talking about wrestling, he wasn't talking about WWF stuff. It was more like MMA stuff, but without too many rules. Because in that day, they could actually gouge somebody's eye out or you could bite somebody. But it was the training that the Lord led me to. Because after the intense training, they would send these wrestlers into a hot box like a sauna. And, 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 and I never understood that because they were exhausted. They would, send them into, they would send them into this hot box like a sauna to cause for their pores to open up. And then when they got hot enough... Remember what I told you that in order for 
a weapon, a sword to become battle ready, they will put it in a hot box. And they let it get hot through heat treatment. And what then they what the what they would do is they would let them go into this hot sauna and they would heat up and cause for their pores to open up. So that when they got hot enough, then they would take some oil and they would rub that oil in. And what would happen is they would rub that oil in into their wrestlers and they would they'd get it so that that oil would then get into their skin so that that oil would then abide within them. This was for training. Because they were getting in that already. Because when they faced the real battle, and they found themselves in a position where the enemy would hold them and cause them to, 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 to be locked down or held down. All of a sudden from the heat, from that battle, it would cause for their pores to reopen and release that oil out of them so that what was meant to hold them bound, they now slip right out of that hole and break off the enemy. This is what I believe God has called us to do. I'm calling all of you men to come up to the front. Pastor James, I want you to join me. Pastor Baker, please join me up here, please. We're going to sing a song, but we're going to anoint you, men of God, because we want you battle ready. We're going to place an anointing upon you. We're going to allow that to abide in you. And here's the thing. It's a representation of the real thing. The real thing needs it, means that you need to abide in what that oil represents, the Holy Spirit and God's presence. Abide in his presence because he is the oil that causes you to be battle ready so that in the midst of the battle, you will not break. You will not be held bound but you will rise up to be the men of God that you are called to be. For we are called to not just be, not to just be conquerors, but to be more than conquerors. So I want them to sing this song, and we're going to come around, we're going to anoint all of you men. Y'all ready to be battle ready? Yes. You ready to be battle ready? Yes. Amen. You are the fire. We are the temple. You are the voice. We are your song. You are our God. We are your people. You are the light. We stand in all.
Come on, say breathe. Come and breathe on us. Spirit, breathe. Come and breathe on us. Spirit, breathe. Come and breathe. Bye. 
for those men that came up last night that uh I think brother you came up yes I remember and brother David did you get one handkerchief you did get one anyone else was here last night that did not get a handkerchief that came up for prayer for healing anyone need a want to take one of these handkerchiefs with them come here brother Sheldon come on brother come on I got two sir. Bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Let it be a, a memory or let it be something that reminds you of God's presence. Remember to focus on him. Remember that it is he that is our healer. And it's his presence that makes all the difference. Oh, somebody give God some praise in his house. Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy, oh God. You know, it's amazing when God gives you a vision and then he exceeds that vision. God, you are so good, God. Thank you, Father, for the word that was shared here, oh God. Thank you, Father, for the miracles that took place here, Father. But most of all, thank you, Father, that your presence was felt in this house, Father. You are the reason we are about already. Yes. And every devil in hell should be afraid right now. We're going to take back what the devil has stolen. And everywhere you step your foot, you see, when you are a carrier of the presence of God, everywhere you step, the Lord steps too. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I never want to take it for granted. But I knew that there was one assignment that the Lord had, one, another assignment that the Lord had given me. And I just want to ask everyone to bow their heads, please. I do not want you to leave here today without giving an opportunity to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. To receive his forgiveness. And also be washed clean by his blood. And if you are here today and you are ready to give your life completely over to him. And you've never done this before. But you're ready to do so today. If you are here, would you please raise your hand? What's your name, God? All right. Maybe you have served the Lord at one time and you've fallen away. For whatever the circumstances, not, that's not what's important. Right, right now is what is important. A decision you make right now. If you've fallen away from the Lord and you're ready to recommit your life to Jesus Christ... And you're here and you're saying, I want to remake my, I want to recommit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I want all of us to pray this prayer. As even if we have committed our lives to the Lord, it's a, like renewing your vows. Let us pray this prayer. Say, God in heaven, God in heaven I, acknowledge that I'm a sinner, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I've fallen short, and I've fallen short of, your righteous standard. of your righteous standard. I deserve, I deserve to, be judged to be judged for all eternity for, all eternity for, my, sin. for my sin. I thank you, I thank you for, not leaving me for not leaving me in this state. In this state. For I, believe for I believe that you sent Jesus Christ, you sent Jesus Christ your only begotten son, only begotten son who, was born of the Virgin Mary, who was born of the Virgin Mary to die for me, to die for me and to carry, my judgment to carry my judgment on the cross. On the cross. 
cross. I believe, I believe he was raised again, he was raised again on, the third day on the third day and is now seated, and is now seated at, your right hand at your right hand as my Lord, as my Lord and as my Savior. my Savior. So on this day, on this day of October, October 5th, 5th 2019, 2019, I give my life, I give my life entirely, entirely and, completely and completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I confess you, I confess you as, my Lord as my Lord and as my Savior. And as my Savior. Come into my life, Come into my life through, your spirit, through your Spirit and change me, and change me into, a child of God. into a child of God. For I renounce, For I renounce the things of darkness, the things of darkness that once Held me, bound. held me bound and from this day forward, from this day forward I, will no longer I will no longer live for myself, live for myself but, for you, but for you who gave yourself to me, gave yourself to me that, I may live forever. that I may live forever amen, amen. pastors I gotta tell you something that the Lord had convicted me about We learn to, we really press into worship, trying to give God our worship, and nothing wrong with that. But like a husband with his bride, learning how to worship our bridegroom. It's like just having relationship with him. This is what the Lord was speaking. He said, but you're giving me no, no children. It's like you want to have your time with me, but you're giving me no children. I want you to get me children, son. There's people out there that are lost that need to know me. We're worshiping in the, in, in the house. We're worshiping, come together. We've learned how to worship our God. But we need to save those who are lost. Can I tell you one thing about God? He's a father. And this father will never miss the birth of one of his children. When someone commits their life to the Lord, the presence of God becomes so strong and so real. He says that the angels in heaven cry out and a party in heaven begins. So every time that I get up here to minister a word, I never want to give or allow there to be a time that I would miss one of his children being born. So I want to thank God and give him some praise for that man that raised his hand today. Can you give God some praise? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us have that fire within us to reach out to the men on our jobs, to reach out maybe even to a waiter at the restaurant. Maybe you can pray for them when you're praying for your food and ask them, hey, is there anything that we can pray for you? You never know what they might be going through. They just might be facing something difficult in their life and they're just trying to do their their time at work and you could be that angel that God sends to set them free amen let us have that that drive within us to reach the loss and to get out there and to not hide our light under a basket or a bushel but to let it shine for all the world to see amen amen give the Lord one more hand clap of praise go ahead and turn on the lights This has been an amazing men's conference. Yes. 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 Have you been blessed? Yes. Yes. Amen. Give God some praise for that. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Once again, pastors, Pastor Baker, God bless you, sir. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. We love you. Give our love to mother as well. Go ahead. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Pastor James. Man of God, powerful, powerful word. Would you give the Lord a, a hand clap of praise for Pastor James as well? 
Thank you. For all of you men of God, thank you for being here today. My prayer is that you were blessed and blessed immensely. And that the Lord has reassured you. And that now when you walk out there, you're going to be better ready. So pastors, I'm expecting our praise and worship tomorrow in our services to be led by the men. Because you have something to shout about. You won't be like when Jesus said, when the Pharisees were telling Jesus to tell your, your people to, to be quiet. He said, if I tell them to be quiet, even the rocks will cry out. I ain't going to let no rock take my place. I'm going to lift up the greatest hallelujah to my God and my King. Amen. Amen. Let them shout. Let them praise. But we're going to lift up a shout unto our God. Amen. 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 Pastor James, I would love for you to come here and close us out in prayer you do so sir praise the lord let us join hands if we can men wherever we at come together this last time at the close of our battle ready forged by fire conference it's been such a blessing and an honor to be in your men presence look he's stretching praise the lord let us go before the lord in prayer eternal and gracious father we thank you so much for this time you have allowed us as men to come together on one accord and i sense so strongly in my spirit that you are well pleased so now god we leave here on fire and god we know that spiritual light of fluid when times get rough all we need is a squeeze of a scripture to keep us going like jeremiah Thank you for every pastor in their house will be on fire. Thank you for every home that will be on fire. Thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Cassie just opening up this place for we can come together this weekend and truly bask in your presence. Now, God, as always, as we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence. Be with us. We declare nothing will be missing, nothing broken, and nothing lacking because of this conference. I thank you, God, that you're faithful. And we give you an advance praise for every praise report, every miracle that we will hear about. And we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go in peace. God bless you. Quick picture is what I heard. Quick picture, man.